Congratulations on this new album. Um, I was lucky enough to to get a, a chance to to listen to it, and I was bopping along the roads to it. It's Thanks. it's got a great melody to it. It's did really you listen great. to it top to bottom. I did. I listened to it right through. Is that how it's meant to be heard? Uh, preferably, yeah. It's like a book. Seems rare these days, but we would definitely yeah. love everyone to hear it top to bottom. Well, that's kind of how I look at albums. I see them as being almost like you know, like books. Mm. You wouldn't kind of pick up a book and go chapter eight, then chapter two, then yeah, or or a film. You wouldn't watch the middle of a yeah. film and not the beginning or the end. Yeah. Does yeah. the album tell a story then, going through it that way from start to finish? You could look at it like that. You know, it's not written as such. In mm. fact, at the last moment, we sort of scrambled the order of the songs. We all had different opinions, but in the end. It does tell a story. Yeah. You know, all those songs came from a time. They were written at a time. and uh, Okay. It's better yeah. to hear the whole thing. Okay. Before we get into the album, I would like you to pick a couple of tracks for me, if that's all right. Not your own music, but a couple of tracks that we can play. We like to set the mood of the show by asking our guests to pick whatever they want. And it can be absolutely anything. Have anything. You two pieces of music that you would two like us to play. Two pieces of music, anything. That mean something to you. That maybe, I don't know, they're your go-to tracks that put you in a good place or... So maybe Axis Bold is Love. Great. Just because. Just because. Just good enough reason. Yeah, just because. <laughs> and then... <laughs> um, maybe Ripper to Shreds by Blondie. Oh, great. Nice, know. good yeah. choice. Yeah. Great, perfect. Why that one? I don't know. It just popped into my head. <laughs> That's the good thing about music. It's that kind of way that it... I guess transports you in a way as well. Where does Where do those tunes transport you to? Music does transport me, and um, it just puts you in a that land, and I don't I don't know what to call it, but yeah. that's why I listen to music because everyone needs to take the edge off a little bit and get out of their their busy mind. Yeah, and music does that all the time. When whenever we're backstage and we're getting ready to play a show, and I start to fret and fuss and get nervous, and is the set list correct, and is my voice ready to go for two hours, and then Flea will just put on music. And I'll be like, oh, I'm fine. Everything's <laughs> good. It's music. Yeah. And music has a life of its own, and all I have to do is go play music. Yeah. Is yeah. he is he always in charge of the pre-gig tunes then, Flea? He's not always. Josh is also busy with that, but Flea has good intuition <laughs> before a show. Yeah. Not necessarily when you're driving around, but before a show, <laughs> he knows what to play. Yeah. It could be anything from The Germs to Charlie Parker. Wow. But whatever it is, it gets the, the juices flowing at the same time kind of puts you in the pocket. Yeah. Yeah. Josh Moore for the road trip. Excuse me? Josh Moore for the road trip. Josh? No, Josh anytime. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm I'm just acclimating to your <laughs> yeah. Scottish accent over here. Take your time. I'll slow down. Sorry. I no, it's all right. Speed up. Speed up. No, I can't. No one will understand me. I like the challenge. <laughs> um, there's a great story about this, the, the making of this album as well, and the fact that you guys had kind of 20 to 30 songs ready to go. And then Flea had this snowboarding um, accident, which, yeah. which kind of shifted everything, really. But, you know, things happen for a reason. It derailed and the party train. We were absolutely beside ourselves. We were kind of in mourning, looking down at the ground, going, what? We we're just ready to go. And Danger Mouse had made time in his busy schedule, yeah. which is crazy. And then it all fell apart. And we really had to go rushing for that acceptance and it turned out to be a blessing in disguise for sure because the next nine months we really got our heads together. We rewrote songs, we wrote new songs, and had that not happened, I, I don't think our record would be as good. Yeah. I think we ended up with a really good record that wouldn't have happened had Flea not gone haywire on the, on the <laughs> final slope of the day. No! Oh yeah, end of the day, light was disappearing, I went in, he's like, I'm just gonna do one more. <laughs> Cut to, I get a call, he's in an ambulance. Ow! Yeah. Where were you snowboarding? Montana. Oh wow, I've, I, my cousin lives in Mammoth, mm -hmm. up above them. Um, you LA. have a cousin in Mammoth. Yeah. Okay. So we go there every two years. It's great. It's great. It's good boarding in Mammoth. Yeah, we used to uh, hitchhike up to Mammoth when we were kids, <laughs> or, or take the Greyhound bus. Wow. In fact, we slept in laundry rooms just so we could go skiing back then, pre yeah. snowboard. Yeah. I love it up there. It's even the drive up there is just wonderful. You kind of go through Lone four Pine. seasons in one kind of yeah. drive. Da what did Danger Mouse bring, do you think, or kind of, not what you learnt from it, but, you know, working with someone like him, you know, who would not be maybe an obvious choice for people to say for you guys to work with and stuff. What what was the experience of working with him on this particular album? The dude is a musical stud. <laughs> I, I kid you not. Yeah. He is a musical stud. When you meet someone and you want to do a musical project, he's a great choice. He is highly intelligent, 
wildly passionate and deeply thoughtful day in and day out. He is he doesn't come and go. He doesn't show up late. He gets there early and he stays late and then he goes home and he works some more. Yeah. So when he engages in a process, he's all in. And that is beautiful. And that's what we wanted and we needed to get out of our comfort zone and he put us well out of it because he had no trouble telling us <laughs> when he didn't like something. Yeah. Which is a, a, a valuable skill. Yeah. To be able to tell an artist, I, I, I think you can do better than that. And it kind of, you know, pushed us and pushed us and we found new things that we didn't know we had inside of us. So that's amazing because, you know, 11 albums and sort of thing to have someone kind of come in and kind of, it's so important to keep learning, isn't it? Very. Very. And we learned from him and hopefully vice versa. <laughs> what do you think he learned from you? Remains to be seen. He, he, you know, we were in the studio for three months and the day we finished, he took a month long road trip. Yeah. For real. As he, far away as by, possible. By himself, he got in a car and he drove to Maine <laughs> wow. from Los Angeles, taking his time. So he needed to clear his head after that thing. Just listening to Chili Peppers in the car for the whole trip. Not <laughs> at all. I love the cover. Mm. I love the cover. Is it? I mean, I heard you say in an interview that you're like, it's us. Chad's the bear, Flea's the raccoon, uh, Josh is the girl, and I'm the raven. Yeah, well, who is else that, could it be? Is that is that true? It's true. <laughs> okay. It's true. I mean, you you wouldn't call Chad the girl. You'd call him <laughs> no. the bear. Yeah, He's so. twice the size of anybody in the band. <laughs> Josh has a lovely female energy yeah. about him. Yeah. Um, Flea fancies himself to be the raccoon, the, the, the <laughs> clever little mischievous, cunning yeah. kook. And, and you the raven, it so. Just, it leaves me as the raven, so. <laughs> um, can I ask you to pick a track from the album, please? No, you cannot. <laughs> no? No, you can, of course. Which I was would you just like, kidding. Which would you, I don't know, pick a track and tell me about it. Which one would you like us to play? I, I'm going to choose The Getaway, because okay. I, I have a weird crush on that tune. Okay. And, and I did since long before it had a vocal. I was away from the studio for a couple of days, home writing lyrics, and the boys continued to write music with Brian as the sort of musical director. Yeah. And sometimes they wrote things they forgot about, you know, because they would write little grooves. Yeah. And, uh, and they forgot that they created this groove. And I went in and Brian Burton played it for me, and I fell in love with it. I was like, I can't believe my guys are this good that they just suddenly create that which I've never heard before. And I went and uh, I left the studio and I went to my car and listened to it some more and I just wrote my part within the first 10 minutes of hearing the song. Sometimes you get wow. lucky and you just hear things in the air. And I heard my part and I wrote it and I came back and I said, Brian, I think this is my favorite song on the record. And he said, me too, I really, I was, I'm so glad because, and then I called Flea and I was like, I love that thing. And he's like, what thing? That thing that goes like this. And he's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So they had forgotten about it. And um, then I filled in the blanks with lyrics, and I wanted that to be our first single, but I was alone in my quest, <laughs> which is all right. I don't. I don't so I'll play it now for you. We'll play it now. Yeah, but I love how when you mentioned Flea, you went straight to the airbase. The, the air <laughs> it's like you can't not say his name without just doing airbase. Did I do airbase? You did airbase. Okay. <laughs> yeah. This is the title track from Red Hot Chili Peppers' new album. Uh, it's a getaway. It's a title track from the Red Hot Chili Peppers new album. Anthony Kiedis is with us now. Um, do you still get a kick out hearing your music on the radio? I'd be lying if I said no. I, I The very first time I ever heard our music on the radio, I was driving through downtown Los Angeles and Rodney on the Rock, Rodney Bingenheimer, I don't know if you're familiar no. with this guy, a 70s icon, okay. who in the 80s was a DJ on KROQ in LA. And no one would play our music because no one understood our music and it didn't fall into categories by a long shot and Rodney was ballsy and forward thinking and, and he played a song that made no sense next to the other music but to him the song itself had value yeah and I heard it and I was like I couldn't believe it I was like all these years we've been playing little clubs and finally somebody had the nerve to play us on the radio and, and it touched me and I was very excited I probably called everyone I knew <laughs> and I still do when I hear it um I think that's you just mentioned the fact that you kind of you know no one could really describe your music and you and I love the fact that you can't still you're not in a you're not in a box you're not in a pigeonhole you can't really Chili Peppers is Chili Peppers music it doesn't really fit into a genre of music which is so great to still be doing that so lucky for us yeah because when we go to write songs it doesn't matter what it is yeah it, it doesn't have to be oh it's that's not quite heavy enough or <laughs> that's too heavy or that's too pop or that's too you know, whatever anything goes anything can fly under our banner yeah. 
Um, it was um, you you were talking about the getaway there and the fact that you you went into the studio and you sat in your car. Yes. Cars are always a good place to get a vibe of tunes, I think, as well. In terms of you kind of, it's where you listen to quite a lot of music, isn't it? Driving yes. around the thing. So I think that's where I listen to ninety percent of my music in the yeah. car. In LA, you drive a lot. Yeah. I also have a sound system on my motorcycle. So wow. I, so I can listen to loud music on my motorbike. Is that just for you, in you or can people who are walking past you in the street hear it as well? If they're walking or, <laughs> or sitting at bus stops, they listen to what I'm listening to. Nice. Wh- which is also a good gauge when you're writing. Because <laughs> yeah. I'll pull up to a bus stop full of people with new music. <laughs> yeah. And I kind of gauge the reaction. See if they do air bass. If they're doing air bass <laughs> or if they do, any kind of a head nod will do. Yeah. That's like a sure sign that something's got a groove. If, if they start getting into that sway back <laughs> yeah. and forth, you're like, okay, this is good. The, the notion of writing lyrics that quickly, is that how it always is for you in terms of, you know, it kind of, it just comes. It's On a good day. There are other days when I hear a beautiful piece of music. I'm like, oh, that's beautiful. That's going to make it on the record. That's good stuff. I have no idea what to do. <laughs> and I'll try something with a, the song We Turn Red, which is on this record. I heard that early on when Brian came to work. They yeah. wrote that with Brian. And I knew it was a dope, fat, funky, tough groove with a really pretty melodic bit, which we turned into a chorus. But I couldn't find anything to say, and I couldn't find my my part, my rhythm, my melody, my groove. I just couldn't find it. I tried three times to write something. It, it was stunk every time, but I would come in and try it, and Brian would say, eh, <laughs> I'm not in love with that. And I would go home and I would try again. Eventually, I sort of thought this isn't going to happen, which is okay because we have 20 other things to choose from. Mm. Last day of the recording, I said, I, I'm trying again. I know I've been failing, but I'm trying again. Recorded the entire vocal for We Turn Red. It was looking up to Brian's eyes to see if I'm getting fatherly <laughs> approval or you know, yeah. rejection. No eye contact. <laughs> and he's like, okay, yeah, that's better than the other stuff that you tried. That's better which just means Ooh. that it wasn't horrible. He's hard, isn't he? He was honest. <laughs> but three days went by, and I listened to it every day for three days, and at the end of three days, I was like, no, it's not just better. That That's actually top shelf. <laughs> and I texted him, and I was like, you know, this is really growing on me, the We Turn Red thing. He said, me too. And then I didn't hear anything from the boys in the band, which usually means I hate it. <laughs> They'll let you know if they like yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. They won't let you know if they don't. <laughs> and I texted Flea. Flea, you know, dude, have you heard the new one? I, the very last thing I did, he's like, yeah, that's that's all right. Same thing, it grew on him. Mm-hmm. And um, and then it ended up getting a very coveted slot on our record, like should, third on the record or something. We should play it now then. Might as well. Yeah. After all that river <laughs> That build up. We turn red uh, from the getaway. It's Red at Chili Peppers' new album, and Anthony Kiedis is with me now. I've got a couple of fan questions, if that's all right for you. I've been through them. Don't worry. I'm not worried. <laughs> um, where, are we, where should we start? Uh, Jonathan says, um, we're really talking about producers. The new album wasn't made with, with Rick in the production chair. Um, how Rick is the new LP? Is he still in there? Uh, what, 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 <laughs> what was the last bit? Uh, how Rick is the new LP? Is he in there at all? Is Rick on the new LP? Yeah, it's, it's kind of, I guess, the spirit of oh, him. Oh, the spirit of Rick. Okay. Um, the spirit of Rick is in the band, for sure. I mean, we started working with him in 1990, wow. and he taught us a lot. Um, you know, he came at us at a time when we were trying to sound different than our live selves. When we went in the studio, he was like, don't do that. Just be who you are in the studio. Don't try to change it just because you're in the studio. Yeah. So we've sort of maintained that quality where we just like to be ourselves in the studio. And I think Rick taught us that. So yeah. That integrity is so important. Because, you know, I, I hear it. You know, I get sent so much music and you hear it when bands kind of, you can hear new music and they're trying to fit into what's popular just now. And it just, it just reeks of kind of, no, just keep your integrity. Yeah. It's so important. So important. Um, Ian says, do you have any memories of when you ruled Slane Castle like a king 10 years ago which I had the pleasure of being at Slane I have a funny little memory <laughs> which is you know we were opening for U2 mm-hmm. and uh, they U2 had this kind of ramp that went out into the audience yeah. of Irish people <laughs> yeah. and there was a giant gap between the stage and the ramp that so they had taken out a piece of the ramp. Oh, that's Q don't use it, isn't it? They said don't <laughs> use the U two ramp. That's theirs. That's part of their deal. Yeah. Stay off it. 
And I looked at it and I was like, I think I can clear this gap. So we were performing and I had a little extra adrenaline in me and I cleared the gap. And I and I borrowed their thing, which, by the way, at the end, they did not mind at all. It was more their production yeah. team that wanted the preciousness of this ramp. And I abused our ramp <laughs> during our show. And that was yeah, it's kind of a nice memory. Ireland is a beautiful place to play. Yeah. Did you get back on the stage okay? Was I it, did. Was the return did. journey yeah. okay? Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad. Round uh, trip. Lisa says, uh, are you excited to be playing the Wedding and Leeds Festival again this year? Anything special planned? Um, we plan to rock the F out <laughs> at both of those festivals. It's a huge honor to play those festivals. The fact that people care and they spend their hard-earned money and they gather up and they get their friends and their squads and their loved ones and they go there and they want to be rocked, it's, it means a lot to us, both of those shows. So they're deeply on our mind Yeah, and we'll be ready to go when that day comes. How do you go about putting the set list together for something like that? Um, I have some experience with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but with a new it, album as well to add to that. It's different, but I'm doing it slowly but surely now. So far we've had three songs on the internet, all of which are in our sets. Yeah. And that's what we live for is the new music. It gives us the magic feeling, that, yeah. that weird special, oh my goodness, this has never been played before feeling. Yeah. So, yeah, we we know how to mix it up with the new songs, the old songs, the in-between songs. There, there'd be a nice potpourri of all those songs. That's my job. Yeah. I write it yeah. very painstakingly, put a lot of thought into it, and then I show it to Chad, and he gives it a look, and he says, yeah, that's good. And I give it to Flea, and he takes a longer look. <laughs> yeah. He's like, could we play something else here? And I'm like, yeah, but then that ruins this, which leads into this, and then Josh looks, and it gets done. Great. I like it. Um, what instruments do you play, says Steve? Um. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> have you not seen my bass guitar <laughs> playing? See these air bass. Yeah, no, I, I don't. I don't muck about with the um, the instrumentation so much. Yeah, yeah. I, voice is all I can handle. And yeah. I'm still working at learning how to do that one. Do you, do you just drum away at home or um, the ivories at home at all? My son is tinkling the ivories. Yeah, I, I can pick up a guitar and play three chords. Yeah, um, most people will leave the room. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I I did pen a song on a guitar winch, which ended up on our record. Great. Yeah. See, it's learning, isn't it? Still learning. Uh, I, I'm not an. I'm not really a player. <laughs> Singing lyrics, dancing. Great. Th- yeah, that. Uh, How do you? Um, it, it's quite interesting because we were talking to someone um last week, uh, an artist who he had to take time off because of his voice, because mm-hmm. the voice thing, and, and I guess that's such a worry sometimes when you're, you know, you're doing these shows that are big length, but you've got to this point where it, it's, you know, it's your instrument. It's, Constant worry. Yeah, it, and, but it, in terms of maintaining it stuff, do you have like so a regime? Hard. You have a regime, but sometimes the the universe doesn't care about your regime. Yeah. And if you're singing all night, every night, and you're singing loud, as some singers do, I sing really loud. Yeah. I scream and shout a lot it's almost impossible to maintain your voice because these fine little ribbons that called vocal cords fill up like fat sausages. <laughs> they get full of fluid and blood, at which point they don't vibrate, and you it's not like this. <laughs> so combating that is a, a constant battle, yeah. and sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, and when you lose, it's heartbreaking because you want nothing more than to be able to sing your stuff yeah. and not let the audience or your band down, but there are nights when it's just not happening. Yeah. There are things you can do. You warm up, you warm down, you try not to talk too much. Um, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's you know necessary evil. Yeah. For a singer. Yeah. You drink a ton of water, you mess with your tinctures and your teas and, and n- none of it really can stop the devil when it wants your voice. Yeah. Yeah. Um I was at the Isle of White Festival uh last weekend and uh, what being a fan of music you get the rush that you get as a music fan when a band that you are excited to see comes on stage is it's it overtakes you it's kind of like you can't control it mm. i can't imagine what it's like going on stage to 80,000 people 90,000 people but then when you come off stage do you have a kind of like i don't know i, I was I, I heard chris martin from coldplay recently say he started like going on a, an exercise bike when he comes off stage mm. to kind of help him sort of almost decompress from that you know that two hours of just wonderfulness. Mm. How, 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 what, what's your? Well, I think Chris is a smart man for getting on the bike. <laughs> that that's a that's a very wise idea because there's nothing you can do to wring that adrenaline out of your body so yeah. you can relax and eventually try to get sleep. The other thing that will save your voice, sleep. So, 
I like the feeling just as much of waiting for a band that yeah. I'm into to come on. That's just like you described it well. That is a wonderful feeling. Oh. Like here they come. Yeah. I, I'm about to get what I came for. A walk on. There's uh, someone knows in the crowd. There's one person, don't they? They, they know. They <laughs> sense that they're coming on stage, and then this ripple and this wave just kind of takes over. Oh, it was amazing. It's a good feeling. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's good for the band as well because I think without that sort of nervous anticipation of something's about to happen, we need that. Yeah. Like I want to be nervous for the rest of my life when it comes time to take the stage. Mm -hmm. I need the butterflies to help me. The day that I lose my butterflies, I feel like, eh, what am I doing up here? Yeah. It used to be worse when we were kids. We would throw up before we would go on stage because we were so amped. <laughs> yeah. Like, give me a bucket. <laughs> In a and Scottish was, accent. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> that was a sign that we were about to have a good show. Yeah. Because we cared. We cared enough to throw up mm. before we played. But I might try an actual bicycle. I don't <laughs> like the stationary thing so much, but I might just start biking home from the gig. <laughs> like that, burn yeah. off a little steam. It's got a long bike ride from Reading. But yeah. <laughs> Anthony, it's an absolute pleasure, sir. And I can't wait to see you at Tina Park this year as well. Lots of love. See you then. Thanks. Bye.